today's podcast, we welcome our special guest, Dr. Dave Pazlowski, founder and co-owner of Inside Out Strength and Performance based out of Carlsbad, California. Okay. He's a performance physical therapist. He's, he specializes in strength and conditioning. And his work passion is helping active adults and runners build confidence inside and outside of the gym through strength training, exercise programming, and high performance coaching. Inside Out began as a physical therapy clinic aiming to help people get out of the pain and back to pick back to activity. Think of them as a sh- the strength docs. They will teach you the tools needed to get rid of pain, improve strength, lose weight, and get back to the activities you love with strength and confidence. Dave, welcome to the show, brother. And I just want to give you, I just want to ask you to give our listeners an overview of your story, both personally and professionally, if you don't mind, brother. I would love to, David, and thanks so much for having me on, and I'm excited. You were a guest on my podcast, and um, excited to uh, be able to uh, return the favor here and uh, help your listeners out with uh, some some physical ailments that they've they've been having. So for a, just a quick background on me, I don't need to get into all the nitty-gritty of it, uh, but went to school for physical therapy, got my doctorate of physical therapy, got to play college football there at a little division three school, got to meet my wife there. So a lot of good things coming from, from that originally from uh, Wisconsin, that's Carroll university outside Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And then uh, my wife was finishing up PT school for a couple of years after I worked at a, a private clinic for a couple of years. And then after we got married, we packed up our cars and uh, drove out to San Diego, California, where we planted our flag out here and uh, started our physical therapy practice uh, 2017. So I've had that coming on four years now. Uh, we specialize in helping active adults, helping people live strong and confident lives. And uh, so I, I've always had this passion for movement and performance and just been fascinated on that. And uh, that's that led me to starting our business and then eventually have branched off even further into something called Men Made for More Coaching, uh, just helping guys specifically, husbands and business owners, uh, help do the same both with their body and also just uh, with their life, their leadership and their legacy. So those are a couple of the, the passions that I have and how we got to where I am today. So awesome, brother. And once again, I just want to thank you for coming on here, brother, to share your wisdom and knowledge to all these hardworking tradesmen looking to level up. Um, Today's topic is called line fit. Okay. It's not uncommon for line workers to experience back and knee pain, especially later in life after they've been working for years, climbing poles, repairing cables, digging holes, and handling heavy materials. What are some practical steps you can give us to help elevate the pain or stiffness that might occur from overuse? Yeah, so it's a great question. And overuse injuries are so common, and they mm-hmm. can present in different ways too. Uh, we we think of overuse injuries sometimes as only being things like a tendonitis or an overuse muscle strain, but even things like herniated discs can be overuse. Those usually they present themselves as a, a one time thing. So you think it's oh, I lifted this thing and I I blew my back out. I I hurt my disc, but in reality these are hundreds of thousands of repetitions of incorrect movement that lead to that over time. So the keys for overuse injuries is one, you want to limit the stress on the tendon, on the joint, on the disc. And the way to do that is uh, activity modification is one way, but for people in your profession, you can't just modify activity. Always. If you got to show up for the job, you got to be able to uh, show up and, and get the job done. There's no calling in sick. There's no, you know, backing out when, when you need to uh, show up for what you guys do. Uh, so the the side the other side of that is then how do you limit the stress on these areas? And the best way to limit the stress on these areas is to build up strength in the right areas, build up the proper amount of flexibility, and then have good good posture, good what we call movement patterns, so that you're not stressing the wrong areas. You're not stressing the joint when the muscle should be working. I like that. I, I do. Um, how does ergonomics play a key role in preventing these injuries? Yeah, it's a, it's a great segue into, so when we talk proper movement patterns, ergonomics is another way to look at that. And that's essentially just, you know, your, your posture, how you're going about your, your work day or your, your work routine. And that's probably the biggest thing for tying back into the last question. The biggest thing for these overuse injuries is making sure you're in a good position. If Mm -hmm. you're, if you're going to lift something super heavy and you have your back is completely rounded or flexed, that's going to put a ton of stress on your lower back versus doing it in a way that allows you to use your, those big hamstring muscles, those big glute muscles, those big back upper back muscles that are meant to 
pick up heavy loads and transfer the force. So that's where ergonomics plays such a big role is uh, we can take an example of uh, that's with the lower back, say a biceps tendon injury or a, a shoulder injury. Uh, if you're always in this rounded, and I don't know, everyone has the video, but if you're in this rounded forward position where your shoulders are shrugged forward, they come in front of your ears and you're trying to lift and pull and or press things in that position, it's going to put a ton of strain on the front of your shoulder versus using all those surrounding chest and back and shoulder muscles to help do the trick. So being aware of your positioning or your ergonomics is going to play a huge role in making sure you're working the right areas and not stressing the wrong areas. Yeah, I always was told as a, as a lineman work position, you know what I mean? Always try to put yourself in a position. And I know sometimes in our trade, it's not possible. You know what I mean? <laughs> sometimes you just got to reach and get her, yep. you know? but you know, you can limit those injuries by actually doing proper ergonomics, um, stretching well, programs. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, brother. Yeah. I just want to jump in there real quick, David. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. I think you make a good point because it's not, it's not, saying that you need to have perfect ergonomics hundred percent of the time when you have to just get in there and do it, mm -hmm. just get, get done what you, what you need to get done. But even it's the little things that people don't realize of, uh, the, the extremes where you're, you're doing something extremely physical. Like sometimes you just have to find a way to get it done, but how are you, how are you picking up a, a heavy work bag or heavy equipment when you're, when you're on your way there, how are you carrying those things? How are you doing those things? Those you have a lot more control over, I would imagine, mm -hmm. than uh, necessarily the, the, the big lift or the, the thing where you have to necessarily do it. So I just wanted to add that in there that even the little things go a long way, because if you're doing those minor things that are causing your back to get a little more irritated, a little more sore, then mm -hmm. it's going to put you at a bigger risk when you do have to go do something heavy or more extreme. Hmm. And that makes a lot of sense, just being aware and just doing the things that you can control. So when you go to those dynamic movements, which are really at the end of your power, and you, you're like, in what we say, reaching getting her, you know, what I mean, you're not fatigued. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really like that. And I think that'll help our listeners. Now, stretching programs. I see more a lot uh, more along the lines of uh, utilities and even these uh these line colleges that are going out there, they're starting to utilize these stretching programs, you know, and they're an avenue more and more utilities are taking to battle mus musculoskeletal disorders. What are some types of stretches we can do to warm up and make our bodies more limber and less prone to injuries? Yeah, really, really great question. And, and these mobility programs, these flexibility programs are, are gaining a lot of popularity in the mainstream, which is great. And in, in your profession, it's great to see because there's so much value in keeping your body limber. It's not just about being strong. If you're strong, but super stiff, you're not, it's going to limit the amount of strength you can actually use because your body can't get into those certain positions of power of explosiveness of strength that you need. So the mobility program becomes really important to help limber yourself up. And the, the key places we like to focus on, and especially in, in your profession, hips, shoulders, upper back, those are going to be areas that are going to tend to be prone to cause stiffness. And I uh, like to start with the hips because uh, we, we think of a knee problem as being a problem with your knee or a back problem being a problem with your back. But in reality, these issues have are a result of a lack of mobility above or below the joint. So in that example, where I say you're rounding your back, when you go to lift something heavy, if you're stiff in the hips and your hamstrings are so tight that you can't bend forward without rounding your back, then there's no amount of awareness or no amount of posture awareness that's going to help that. So that's where having the requisite mobility becomes really important. So starting with the hips will protect your lower back, will protect your knees. And then if you can mobilize the upper back, doing things like, uh, you know, even just sitting in a chair and rotating as far as you can to one side to get uh, your upper back moving better. Uh, good things for the hips are like sitting in the bottom of a, like a squat position. If you need to hold on to something, hold on to a doorway, hold on to your car or something and drop down to a full squat and feel those hips opening up. There's a, those are a couple of real simple, easy things you can do uh, with, without any equipment that can, can go a long way. And there's a, a whole bunch of other uh, ones you can do now uh, you guys can more than welcome to uh, to reach out to me uh, if david can get my contact info in the show notes i'd be happy to direct some away we've got hundreds of videos up on our our youtube channel if you guys need something specific uh, there's there's plenty out there you guys can do but hips and upper back would be the two things that came to mind when you uh, mentioned that question how can we identify the cause of the pain 
assess if there is a way to minimize the exposure and make the appropriate changes needed to pre prevent continued pain and injury? Yeah, another good question. And that's a, that's a loaded question. That's, a, that's, that's what we make a living off of is identifying that and assessing it. Uh, there are some, uh, s some I guess, key, key things to, to think about is, yeah. like I kind of mentioned the last thing, where you think the pain is, is usually not the, the cause of the pain. So that's, that's where it can be really deceiving. I think that's where most people go wrong is their lower back hurts. So they start uh, putting the heating pack on their low back. They do some stretches for their lower back. They try and massage their lower back. But like I said earlier, your tight hips or your weak hips or a weak core might be the cause of that, or even tightness in the shoulders can, can cause that. Uh, there's a lot of other things that can be going on. So make sure you're looking above and below the area. So an example of lower back, make sure you're checking the hips, checking the mid back. If your knees are hurting, you need to make sure the ankles are flexible, the hips are flexible and strong. So that, that would be probably the, I guess the biggest you know thing to keep in mind is that the pain is not always where you think it is. And then other than that though, it can, it can kind of be hard on, on yourself to do that. I'm, I'm biased of course, but I, I really would recommend getting a, you know, a coach who can identify it, a PT, a good PT who can identify it, someone who can help you see that. Cause even when I have issues going on, I have to go find help from, from someone else who can do that because it's hard to see on ourselves where our limitations are. We have blind spots. We have things that we can't necessarily tell. So finding a good professional can always help with that. But I, if you're on the right track, whatever you try, you should notice some, some good improvements in your pain within, within a week or two. So if you're on the right track, you should get some pretty quick feedback from that. If not, you might have to try either a different strategy or, or find someone else who can, who can help out with that. Mm, God, such good information, brother. Now let's talk about pain pills and alcohol. This is rampant in society today, right? And in our yep. trade, how can one elevate the pain naturally? anti-inflammatory diet, uh, rice method, what would you suggest? Yeah, that's, uh, another, another tough question. Cause I know these, and you and I both know these, these things run deep. And if it's, if it's purely to, to medicate pain, that's one thing, but mm -hmm. obviously there's other, other factors that go into it of, of why is the, why is the self-medication occurring? And, uh, those things obviously need to be addressed first and foremost, and those go beyond just the the physical side of things. But as, as we look at the physical side of things, assuming that that's, uh, addressed, uh, like you mentioned, anti-inflammatory diet is going to be, is going to be huge. And that's one of the best starting points, uh, to, to give a little specifics on that. I'm, I'm not a nutrition expert, but that's things like, like more veggies, avoiding, you know, high processed foods, high carbs, high sugars, uh, that's just getting more high quality ingredients, less processed foods, more high quality ingredients. Uh, so that can go a long way. Just movement in general is such a big thing of, the more you sit, the more you stay still, the more your joints are going to stiffen up, the less you're going to get blood flow and be able to get rid of some of that inflammation. So just getting moving, that can be standing up and, and taking a loop around the house instead of sitting in the, the couch for so long. That can be, you know, just standing up, doing a couple of those stretches can, uh, can go a really long way. And then there's some more, there's, there's lots of other natural things out there that, uh, go along with, with diet. Uh, but, uh, low, low, inflammatory diet, movement, stress reduction, again, things, things that uh, don't cost, don't cost a lot. Stress reduction and being able to manage your stresses, uh, whether people use meditation or prayer or different things to help do that journaling. I know those things sound kind of, especially in a, you know, a, a, a macho profession, those things don't, don't sound flashy. They don't necessarily sound cool for guys, but mm -hmm. they go such a long way in, in helping with stress reduction, which can actually help with, uh, our response to pain, how our body interprets pain. And then sleep is one of the biggest performance enhancers that most people don't use a lot of high quality sleep can let your body recover, can reduce your pain, uh, reduce the amount of pain you're having, can just let your body actually repair the way that it needs to. Hmm. That's interesting that you say that because when you're at that level of pain, like some of these line hands are out there at, you're willing to try everything, <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Especially to, to kick, the habits of pills or whatever, you know what I mean? So I, I like that you put that in there. Um, knee and shoulder back injuries. Okay. These are some of the most common in this industry. What are some strengthening exercises you can share with the audience to help prevent injury or to regain lost strength? 
Yeah, great question. And uh, knee, back, and shoulder happen to be the the top three things we we see in our clinic as well. So this is right up our wheelhouse if we want to start from the bottom up. Looking at the knee, a few things to keep in mind. You want to, from a strengthening standpoint, and I, I'm going to kind of break these down. So we'll go through each one. I'll give a quick the muscle groups you want to strengthen and the areas that you want to stretch might be a, a good way for your listeners. Does that sound like it would be helpful? Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. So yeah, so let's start with the knee. Uh, so knee pain, very common. Uh, the lack of mobility things we talked about, you want to make sure your your ankles are mobile, which would be stretching your calves, doing things to make sure that your ankles have enough mobility and then your hips as well. So those two things will take the stress off the knees. And then in terms of strengthening things, your quads and your hips are going to be the areas that you primarily want to strengthen. So quads can be things like, like lunges can help with this. Bodyweight squats can help with this. Uh, things like, like single leg deadlifts, single leg, even balance activities can help you, uh, better protect the knee and, and stabilize it. So those would be a couple very simple starting points. Again, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, things we can do beyond that, but just think strengthening the quads, the hamstrings. So front and back side of the thigh, and then up around the hips as well. Things, uh, lying on the ground, lifting your hips up, lots of different things you can do for that, uh, for the low back. You need to be able to strengthen the core. Core is the the big one for that. Often gets overlooked. Those core muscles are super important to do that. And mm -hmm. a lot of people think sit ups when they think core or crunches, but even more things like uh, like planks, like side planks. Those things are going to be really helpful for people because the core doesn't do a lot of. You know, there's not as much of this crunching motion that actually happens when when you guys are probably doing what you're doing. But it's a lot of being able to lock this stable position in the stable low back position as you transfer this load as you go and reach for this thing so having a stable core with things like planks and side planks can go a long way and then uh, i already mentioned this earlier but stretching of the hips stretching of the upper back can go a long way mm -hmm. for the shoulder i want to make sure that uh if you have capability to do any bands or things a lot of rows a lot of posture stuff where you're pulling your shoulders back stretching out the front of the chest, get in the doorway with your arms at 90 degrees, lean into that stretch, open up the front side of your shoulders, strengthen the back side. So things like rows, pull aparts, things where you're getting those shoulders pulled back and opened up is going to be a good general rule of thumb for people. One of the misconceptions I heard, and I, I was guilty of this is military press. Okay. We were always taught military press, everything. I, I once saw this, uh, documentary where they're saying don't lift above you because when you're doing that it's actually putting stress on these little tendons that are causing your shoulder to actually drop down that's where a lot of injuries are occurring in the shoulder how true is that not not true at all okay <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah not not true at all but but with with an asterisk by that because i say not true at all and i want to explain this because it's not true at all if you're doing it correctly if you're doing those things like in a good posture where you talk as you press overhead a lot of people they're either missing mobility or they don't know what they're doing so they press overhead and they have this shrugged up shoulder where their shoulder is getting really close to their ear and they're they're trying to just muscle it up and that is going to put a ton of strain on your on those tendons. So that's why I have the, the asterisk by it because in many mm -hmm. people, it does cause more problems, but if you have the mobility and the awareness and you can press overhead, keeping that shoulder pulled down, nice, proud chest, good, strong position. It's not a, it's not a negative exercise on those tendons. It actually can be a really beneficial exercise, mm -hmm. but a lot of people do perform it incorrectly, which is, which is likely where you saw with that, with that article of why it can be a problem for, for many people. Hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for clearing that up for us. Um, mm -hmm. I want to go into something real quick that's running rampant again is uh, energy drinks, creatine and protein. What are your thoughts? Depends on, on why you're using them. I can't, uh, you know, I can't speak directly to your profession, not knowing the, you know, the mm -hmm. extreme energy demands that are there. I, I know there's got to be a, a lot of them. I definitely... I definitely don't like anyone becoming reliant on them because the the problem is, is it's this short burst of energy and it's this, it's this crash that comes with it that leads you wanting or seeking out more of that. And then you have to have, instead of one energy drink or even one cup of coffee, then you're, you're just having this all day. And what that 
that poses a couple of problems because one, it creates, it creates dependence on something Two, It's not really giving you any more energy. You're just trying to get back to baseline at a certain point. And three, it, it really messes with hormones. It messes with your, uh, messes with your sleep, which we talk about how important that is for performance and recovery. Uh, just, it messes with a lot of those, those, uh, things and really kind of just like burns your body out. It burns out your adrenals and your, mm. uh, your, your body's ability to produce energy on its own. And that creates, chronic fatigue that creates all the things that you're trying to, to fight. So energy drink in a strategic use of if you have to pull an all nighter and you're, and you need to be sharp, you need to be on your game and you need a little boost every once in a while, there's nothing wrong with, with having that. But if you find yourself waking up, starting the day with an energy drink, midday, having an energy drink, having it at night to uh, be able to just to maybe get home, you know, get to the next thing. That's, that's when it starts to become a problem. So you want to try and tackle it as naturally as you can. And that's, you know, when, when able to sleep, those stress management and things we talk about general movement, just making sure you're taking care of your body in a natural way so that you can, you can show up with that energy whenever you need it versus needing something externally to help with that. And that's interesting that you said about the adrenaline or the adrenal glands and stuff like that, that it plagues on. Um, I was reading that that also causes uh, back issues when your adrenal is fatigued and that's, that's what is contributing to a lot of people's back injuries now, or the, the back pain that they're having is because their mm. adrenal glands are so fatigued that it's causing this pain in their lower back. You know, have, have you heard anything about that or. I haven't heard anything directly about it, but it, it doesn't surprise me at all. When, when we say, when I said earlier that pain is complicated, it, it is very complex and anything mm -hmm. that's not working right in the body can, can cause can cause pain, can cause fatigue, achiness, just that feeling of not quite feeling right. So with, with the role that the adrenals play, that's, it's not a surprise that that can cause it. And, uh, when you're that fatigued, you're probably not moving as much. You're not as motivated to get up and walk around and do those stretches you need to. So there's probably a whole cascade of effects that happen when uh, something like that isn't being cared for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we're going on to sports enhancing drugs and how they're on the rise in this industry. Okay. What are your thoughts on these and what are the risks? Yeah. Like, like I mentioned, what the, the, let, let me start here. The, you know, the, the problem with these is that people don't address all the, what I call low hanging fruit that I've already mentioned here on the show. People don't, mm -hmm. people don't address their sleep. They're not on a good workout program. They're not they're not taking care of their mobility. They're not managing their stress. They're not just getting out and moving, which you handle those five things and you're probably going to be performing at, you know, 90, 95% of your capacity. These, these performance enhancing drugs, they're not, they're not meant to take you from, if you're already, if you're only operating at 25% and you're taking a, a performance enhancing drug to try and hopefully get you up to, you know, 90, 95, hundred, it's, it's going to be, it could potentially be harmful on your body because if you take these things, you put on muscle before you have the mobility for it, before your tendons are ready, before, you know, you're doing those, those things necessary, that's going to increase your risk of overuse injury. It's going to increase your risk of a more serious injury. Uh, so, so that's sort of the risk side of it is, is if you're, you know, putting on muscle too fast or trying to accelerate something before doing it properly, then that's going to potentially create a lot of problems. And the second piece is, these things are, are, are just more easily available. These natural remedies, these things that you can be doing that is going to get you all the things that you're hoping the, you know, whatever that energy drink is, whatever that performance enhancing drug is. Uh, so I, I, I would encourage you to start with the, like I said, it's, it's called, I call it the low hanging fruit. Those things that are easy to grab, easy to access, doesn't take a lot of equipment, doesn't take a lot, just takes a, a little bit of intentionality and a little bit of uh, awareness around what you're doing. But those things are going to help you out so much more in the long term. help with the longevity of your career, help with, uh, you know, just, just think about what, how, how you want your knees and your shoulders and your back to be when you're playing with your kids, when you're playing with your grandkids, what kind of, you know, what kind of life are you sacrificing by making that decision now to affect possibly your long-term future. It just doesn't seem worth it to me. You're right. And uh, I agree with you and all that. Anything done that's out of haste or that's done in a hurry. Cause everybody, you know, we live in a society today where everybody wants quick results, quick results. So they take these, you know, testosterone or, or deck or D ball or whatever these things that I call put on mass and give you those t-shirt muscles as I used to like to call them. Right. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, they start enlarging your heart. You know, they start causing all these other organ failures and stuff like that. Uh, you know, so they're not good. And in the long run, you're absolutely right. I mean, you might not be there for your children, you know, if you're having a heart transplant because you took steroids back in the day when you're 19, 20 years old, and now you're in your forties and you're having a, a bypass or something, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And because of these things you did in your youth, you know, um, what are some natural substances that can be used as a substitute? Like, what do you think about like turmeric or like maca root or, uh, you know, horny goat weed or anything of those? Do you, do you suggest any use of those or? Yeah, I can't, I, I can't pretend to be an expert in that area. I know things like turmeric are more like anti-inflammatory might help with some of the joint stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm not really well versed on, on some of those other things you mentioned, but I, I do know one of like one of the best study supplements creatine is, is one of the, the best uh, study supplements out there in terms of extremely low risk, uh, very beneficial for, for putting on strength, being able to do more. Uh, that's, that's an easy one to uh, start with, but in reality, most people, and I, I hate to say this even to, you know, I, I know, uh, probably, especially in your profession, but most people just don't work out hard enough. They, they don't, if, if you want to put on muscle, there's a certain amount of overload that's necessary. You have to overload the muscles enough to create this adaptation, to create this change. And uh, quite frankly, a lot of people want the, they want the muscle growth benefits without really taking the time that it, it takes to it, to invest in that. And, mm-hmm. uh, I, I can tell you what also help, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it, it's extremely important to get across sleep more that helps with your human growth hormone that helps with your recovery that helps with building muscle. It helps with decreasing body fat and belly fat and doing these things and control your stress. Those two things, again, are, are performance enhancers that we, we don't look into. If you're trying to take creatine or take a supplement and then you're sleeping six hours, five, six hours a night, you're getting lousy sleep. You're stressed out all day. Your cortisol is running rampant, which is this, uh, you know, this, this stress hormone that holds on to body fat, it creates less muck, like it, it breaks down muscle. It does these things. So instead of trying to take these supplements to outrun that, take the low hanging fruit, address some of these things, and then you'll, you'll put on muscle if you're, if you're working out hard enough. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Cause that's one of the things that I always, uh, started to, especially getting older, you know what I mean? Cortisol, cortisol, everybody talks about cortisol. So I started taking supplements like a ZMA, which is zinc, magnesium acetate. And that really puts me in that good REM sleep where I need to heal. And I, I saw a major difference, especially when I was really doing a lot of, you know, hours and working really hard and stuff like that. And then on top of that, running five miles after working 12 hour days, <laughs> you know what I mean? So right. the, the ZMA started really helping. Um, can you share with the audience the best type of exercises with limited amount of space, like such as hotel living, trailers, stuff like that, to build functional muscles for strength and endurance? What are some off your head that you can give us? Yeah, good question. Uh, it's hard to beat push-ups. You know, sit-ups maybe aren't the best core one, but I do like sit-ups, planks, side planks, like I mentioned, mm-hmm. lunges, uh, single leg squats, single leg single leg deadlifts. Um, I love if you're, if you're traveling, if you can invest in a pair of mini bands or a stretch band or something is going to be one of the best investments you can make because it fits, it takes up essentially zero room. And you can, if you have a mini band, you can uh, have it around your ankles or your knees. You can do different squat things with that things for your hips. You can do things for your shoulders. Those things you mentioned where you're rotating the shoulders, you're pulling apart. You can do rows. You can add resistance to push ups. Really, the, the possibilities are endless if you if you have a resistance band. But even if you don't, doing those other uh, kind of staple movements that I that I mentioned earlier are going to be uh, really great. And uh, just make sure you're doing them correctly. Find a you know look up a video on YouTube. We've got a bunch. I'm sure you can find a bunch all over Google. Just make sure form becomes the biggest thing with that because when we circle this back to ergonomics or those other things, if you're doing push ups and your shoulders are super rounded forward again you're shifting a lot of the stress to the shoulder joint versus building up those chest muscles, building up those tricep, those arm muscles. So uh, the kicker with that, make sure you're prioritizing form over just trying to do a ton of reps. Quality over quantity. I like that. Um, I utilize kettlebells. You know, I used to do calisthenics. I, I brought a pull bar with me and I would bring a kettlebell. And that's what I used when I would stay in, in, you know, a trailer or a hotel and, that's some of the things that I used. How do you like, did you, do you recommend a kettlebell at all or? Absolutely. I love kettlebells. It's one of our, it's one of our favorite tools. 
Uh, if you think getting an exercise band opens up possibilities, getting up a kettlebell <laughs> opens up a whole whole bunch more. And there's uh, there's just a, a great piece of equipment because you can add some load to it. So for some people, if you get really good at the body weight exercises, you need a little more of a challenge. So that can add a load to it, but it also can. Uh, there's a lot of benefit when you have a kettlebell holding on one side of your body, pick up something heavy, carry it, do those squats with it on one side. Then all of a sudden you're changing the whole exercise because one side of your body's loaded, which means it causes all these different demands of what core muscles, what stabilizer muscles have to work, switch it to the other side. And it's a whole other exercise again. And that's, especially for your profession, much more functional because Mm -hmm. how often are you you know, in this perfectly symmetrical position where the weight's evenly distributed and you, uh, like, like a barbell in a gym, that's what so many people want to do barbell deadlift or something, but how often in, in your profession is, is it this nice symmetrical, easy, smooth plates are balanced, clips are on, and it's just this nice symmetrical thing. And it just doesn't happen. No, it doesn't happen at all. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, what are your thoughts on time under tension to gain muscle? Yeah, something- that's it. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's just a, it, it's a great strategy. I think uh, time or attention is a great way to add complexity to some of those body weight movements. If you're taking something like a push up, instead of maybe trying to do you know as many push ups as you can, try lowering down, controlling five seconds on the way down, pausing for five seconds, and then explode up really fast. And that's going to totally change the exercise. It uh, allows your muscles to have to control that movement. There's good benefit on the tendons and the joints for that as well. So I think it's a, a really great strategy. Hmm. Yeah. That's uh, something I started looking into and started learning about uh, time under tension, you know, and uh, it does, it changes up the boring monotony of just doing calisthenics, you know, now you're doing these explosive push-ups, or, you know, even implementing um, burpees. I mean, burpees build wind like crazy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know what I mean? It's one of the things I started doing now is I do 20 burpees within a minute, every minute for 60 minutes. And you want to talk about pain. Holy smokes, dude, that thing will smoke you. You know what I mean? But I mean, that's just one of the exercises that I started implementing in my, my regiment. You know what I mean? And you can do it anywhere. That's a great thing. You know, hotel room, trailer, whatever, you know what I mean? So. That's impressive. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of burpees. That's uh, more burpees than I want to be doing, but if you want to build up some cardio, some cardiovascular and build up some of that endurance, that's a, uh, that's one way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Now I got a, a kind of a funny question, but it, it came in and it's uh, for those wanting t-shirt muscles, right? What is the difference between strength and growth? <laughs> I love the question. There's a, you know, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with one and t-shirt muscles. If you're doing those other things correctly, if you're doing it right, I think, uh, I think you should have some t-shirt muscles. If you're working hard, you know, have something, have something to show for it. But, uh, to your question, the, you know, the, the strength side of things is, is going to be the ability to just produce force to maybe lift a lot of weight, which is definitely going to be important in your profession. Uh, growth side of things though, there's, you know, that's the actual muscle size. That's, that's the size of the muscle. And, and they, they aren't always synonymous as in they don't always, you don't always have strength and muscle growth, or just because your muscles are big, doesn't mean you're necessarily strong. Uh, so there are ways to train both with, with different rep schemes. Uh, but that's, that's sort of the, the biggest difference. And, um, uh, like I said, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with, uh, with wanting some t-shirt muscles, but, uh, some of those different things, time under tension, making sure you're doing the right rep schemes for that. All those things are going to become important for, for doing that. And for those of us who don't know, what are like, how many sets of reps should one be doing for strength? What do you say? I've heard so many different things. What is, what are your mm-hmm. thoughts on that? Yeah. So most, most commonly uh, accepted strength is actually a much a much lower rep scheme than, than people think if you're getting above general rule of thumb five reps they'll, they'll say they'll say one to six reps typically but five reps is sort of in your mind think of that cutoff as strength so five reps and that should be something heavy you shouldn't have a lot of reps left in the tank as i say as in if you finish a set if you're supposed to aim for five and you do your five and you're like i could probably do two or three more you're probably not you're probably not training for strength as much as you think this should be something heavier where by those last couple reps, you're starting to, you're starting to fatigue. You're starting to be like, okay, that, that was a a good, 
a good point for that. So keep the reps low on that. Uh, do something like three sets of five, five sets of five is a great, a great thing for, uh, for strength movements. And then as it relates to putting on size, you're going to want to be more in the eight to 12 rep range is a, a rule of thumb. And those are going to be more, those higher, higher rep things still at a moderate weight though. Mm-hmm. Again, you don't want to leave too many reps in the tank for that. So if you're aiming for eight, maybe you want to have, you want to have, you know, a couple reps left in the tank, but, uh, it should be moderately heavy enough that you're stressing the muscle to give it the stimulus to grow. Hmm, I like all that stuff. And I know our audience is definitely going to appreciate everything you said. Some of the takeaways I got from you were form, right? Make sure you're not rounded, uh, quality, uh, quantity over or quality over quantity, right? Uh, sleep's another one, you know, make sure you're getting that proper sleep. So you get, your body can actually heal. And last but not least is diet, you know, making sure you're staying away from those stuff that's going to cause inflammatory, uh, you know, uh, flare ups and stuff like that. Um, I thank you, man. I mean, this was awesome. I I know it's going to be able to touch our audience and they're going to be able to really utilize this, you know, especially being on the road, trying to get in those workouts that, you know, after working 10, 12 hours, you know what I mean? They're going to be able to come home and be like, all right, well, maybe I'll utilize this. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start working on my core and be intentional about that. So uh, if there's anything else you want to add, brother Dave, uh, how can they get a hold of you and stuff like that? Yeah. Uh, one more, one more thing I do want to add. And cause I, I just, I, it came in my heart as you were talking about it is uh, those, those things that we talk about are they're, they're, they require intentionality. They require just a a little bit more effort. These things don't require hours and hours a day. And I think that's where most people get overwhelmed with it. If you're working a 12 hour day, your energy is low, your time is low. You're trying to balance everything. Don't put so much pressure on yourself, even starting with, you know, five, five or 10 minutes in the morning and five or 10 minutes at the end of the day, you'll be surprised the compounding effect that can have over time. So take some of the pressure off. If you feel like you need to do this all at once, you need to implement all these things pick the one thing you heard today in the show that maybe diet stand out to you. Maybe it's your sleep. Maybe it's your stress. Maybe it's getting a little bit more stretching in. pick one thing to start and just start chipping away at that, get in the habit of doing that and then layer in some of these other things. So that, that was the only other thing I wanted to add because people can get overwhelmed with hearing all this. Uh, I, I do this for a living. So uh, of course I'm throwing all these things out there, but I, I want to also bring it back and say, Pick one thing, start small with it, and just just get started with it. Pick up some momentum, and you'll be surprised at the progress that can happen over time with that. All right, right on, brother. I thank you for throwing that back in there, and just mm. yeah, exactly because there was so much amount of information that you just gave out to our audience. But uh, I like that you said that. Pick one thing and get good at it, and it's part of being intentional. So I thank you, Dave. Uh, I appreciate you. I know you're a busy guy. How can our audience reach you? Yeah, uh, said love love to connect with anyone listening. Uh, I'm grateful that you had me on your show here, David, and uh, a good place to find us. So our uh, PT business, if you guys are interested more on the uh, rehab, mobility, strength, performance side of things, that's at IO Strength Performance. That's IO as an in inside out, and then strengthperformance.com is our website. IO Strength Performance is our Instagram handle for more of the exercise mobility side of things. Uh, for the you know, passion I have on coaching, uh, that can be found at menmadeformore.com. Uh, we have a Facebook group, the Men Made For More Facebook group. I have a podcast, the Men Made For More podcast. So anywhere you search Men Made For More, uh, that's uh, that's where I'll be at personally. And that's uh, if you guys want to go reference and find David's show as well. I don't have the exact episode that was, brother, but uh, that... Uh, maybe a couple months back, I had David on the podcast as well. And we had a, we had a blast talking, uh, talking, especially fatherhood. So if you guys want to start somewhere, I would recommend checking out that podcast to start, but I put out a couple episodes every week too, if you guys want to check me out there. So again, thanks so much for having me, David. I, I had a blast today. Awesome, brother. Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming on here and just sharing your knowledge, brother. I appreciate it, bro. Take care.